Okay, since I've got everyone's attention, since it's got so quiet here, um, let me go on. First off, um, we will have a sign-in sheet. It is coming downstairs. So um, when the young lady with the sign-up sheet appears, because I know that you're all here to get access to the job postings uh, tab within SEU Law Jobs. I think I like to think you're here because we have valuable information to share about the uh, job market and about your function in it and what you can expect in it. But I also know you're here to get the job posting uh, tab on SU Law Jobs. So here is the sign-up sheets. Where do you want? Why don't we start one on this side of the room and one on this side of the room? It's really important you, that you get on the sign-up sheet because even though you all have access to SU Law Jobs right now. You don't have the tab in SEU Law Jobs that says Job Postings. And if you want to look at the job postings, you probably want access to that tab. Um, so the people here in the middle, you've got to make sure the sign-up sheets get over here to this part of the room also, or else um, they're going to be kind of uh, sad about not getting the sign-up sheet. Um, and then for your friends that are watching the video, um, we are putting a code word in it. We, uh, Greg has told us that if you just kind of slide the bar on YouTube and kind of fast forward through the video, the code word doesn't flip up. So um, they actually do have to watch the video in order to see the code word. So it's our sneaky way of having you watch the video. Uh, if you are watching the video, again, you can email the office letting us know that you watched the video and also with the code word. Or if it's more convenient because maybe you have a class on the second floor and you just want to walk over to the front desk of the office and you want to tell us what the code word was and then you watch the video, that works as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be covering today, why you're here, and what we hope to accomplish. So what we're doing today is we're talking a little bit about LCS, we're talking about the legal job market, your expectations about how the job market functions, about when you need to be applying for jobs, um, we're going to be discussing your role in the job market, um, kind of what you can expect for this uh, in the short game, this 1L summer, uh, maybe we'll get a little bit into the long game, what you can expect in the profession. Um, your initial advising appointment. We noticed we haven't had very many 1L sign up for an advising appointment yet. Um, I would recommend that you might want to do that sooner rather than later. And what you might expect over, as I mentioned, kind of throughout this next year with regard to your job search. In the job search, we both have roles and responsibilities, LCS and you as a job seeker. In terms of your responsibilities, you're responsible for managing your job search. That means you need to learn about the legal job market. It means that you need to actively be thinking about your strategy of how you are going to uh, find positions which are advertised, positions which are not advertised, how you are going to be positioning yourself, how you're going to be communicating your strengths, skills, and values to an employer in terms of <coughs> resumes, cover letters, interviews. Um, it means that you need to think about your professional network and how you're building it, how you're managing your reputation, and uh, you know, engaging in the job search process. Like I said, you need to play both a short and a long game, both. In terms of our function in the job market, you may be sitting here going, that's a lot of work for me to do. What in the heck do you guys do in LCS? Um, we do um, two primary things. One of the things that we're doing right now is providing you with educational services about the job market and helping you get information that will help guide you through this process. That's, that's one of our functions, that's one of our services. Um, we monitor the job market, uh, read an awful lot of information, stuff from Citibank, stuff from Wells Fargo, uh, talk to people out there in the practice, to get a sense for what kind of things are influencing legal employers and influencing the job market. Uh, we participate in professional organizations, now follow up on high levels, um, in order to, again, know what's happening in terms of the job market and the legal industry. Um, we go in and actively market the school. We build professional relationships on your behalf with our alumni, with employers, 
We do that in order to help garner uh, job postings, build on-campus interview programs. Um, so these are some of the things that we do. So we practice what we preach because we tell you, you know, go out there, have those informational interviews, meet people, connect, build your spheres of influence, if you will. But we do the same thing. We do that every day, every week, every month. So we're not just encouraging you to do it. That's something that we do in our practice uh, every week. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and introduce you to our staff. Um, many of you already know some of us and have been into the office or our programs. Um, this is Vicki Huebner. She's the assistant dean for uh, our office. My name is Morgan Dane. I am the assistant director for Law Career Development. Um, I work primarily with first and second year students and some third years and graduates. Um, we have Andrea Shaheen, who is the interim assistant director for Law Graduate Employment. She works primarily with PLs and grads. And then we have a subsection of Law Career Services, which is our Public Interest Law Career Services, or PILCS as you will come to know it. And that is actually run by two law students. Um, Yan Li, who is a third year, she has been a post coordinator for two years now. And we also have Sienna Kautz, who is a second year and has been with the office for almost, well, well over a year now. So they are very informed and very well connected within the public interest public sector community and are a fantastic resource. They put on many events throughout the year and they also are an integral uh, part of the public interest public sector day program which we'll talk more about and for those of you who came to the program the other day you also have some information about that as well. Then we have an extensive research and communications team. Our communications manager Greg Williams is in the audience. He is a 2012 grad. Um, we also have a couple of people that support him in that role. Um, they basically uh, create, develop, manage, edit all of the online communication that you see, all of the videos, YouTube videos, all of our social media sites, um, among other things, all, a lot of the emails that are generated. It's a huge job, and we thank them very much. They do great. Um, we also have an extensive research team, primarily made up, or I guess solely made up, of law students. Um, there are about eight people on that team, and one of their primary roles is to network with people in the legal community and do that employer outreach, to bring people in to programs and events, and also um, to help us get connected within the legal community and beyond. And then we have an undergrad staff of about five or six students who are there to assist us from everything from front desk help to events and programs, <coughs> so you'll see them around as well, and you'll probably interact with them at the front office. So that makes up our team. We're a big believer in um, mentoring and advising on multiple levels. So mentoring and advising on the level of uh, you to professionals, us to professionals, you to peers, us to your peers, um, and through using the law students um, on our team, um, not only do they get the experience of you know, having this inside view into career services, helping to extend our services to you, uh, students who are here, but we also get to hear from them part of that because they're living a student experience. Of their experience as a student, and also they are there as uh, peer advisors for you as well. In terms of your job search, there's two games you can play on your job search, and they're not mutually exclusive. Generally, when people come into my office, a lot of times they start off with the question of, what have you got for me? And I'm like, what do you mean, what have I got for you? And what they mean is they're playing the game of, I'm looking at advertised job postings. So they're kind of starting off on this pyramid at about the level that says execution of job search, right below interviewing, um, trying, to, trying to kind of expedite the job search. And when I talk to them, I'm like, I don't know that this is really the way that you're maximizing the opportunities that would be available to you. Because really, when you think about it, everybody is looking at advertised job postings. Everyone. Everyone can get a hold of them, right? That means that you're competing against everyone in the job market. And if you think of it kind of as the, you know, ocean that you have to make a splash in, if you're competing against everyone, you have to be the way that's making the splash. Because otherwise, it's going to be kind of hard to get noticed. So then I'm like, you know, there's another uh, game you can play with job postings. Like I said, they're not mutually exclusive. 
The other game is you could be looking at unadvertised job postings. And people usually go, well, how do I find them if they're not advertised? Where do I go to find them? And I'm like, this is where you get to be the master of your own destiny. You get to chart your own course. And you're going to be planning a game and in a pond with very few people. So when you talk about the splash, you don't need to be a whale to make the big splash. You need to be yourself. And you need to be yourself really well. But if you're going to chart your own path, if you're going to be a master of your own destiny, you need to kind of know where that journey is going to take you. You need to have an idea of where the destiny is. So really, when you think about maximizing opportunities in the job search, and, you really, and if you really want to maximize your chances, you need to start off with, well, what do I want? What do I want to experience? As a first year, that might be one of your questions. What do I think I want to try? You don't need to get it perfect. It might be, well, I think I'm interested in transactional. OK. Go get an experience redlining contracts. See whether you like that or not. You know? Because maybe you will and maybe you won't. Maybe you say, well, you know, I really want to see what it's like to build litigation skills. I ultimately want to be an IP litigator. But I want to get litigation skills. Well, go somewhere where it's going to give you lots of experience to get litigation skills. Maybe that's a DA's office. Maybe it is sitting in a clinic somewhere where you get to interview a bunch of clients. But start with that bottom rung of thinking, well, what kind of experience do I want to have? Because once you do that, it means that you can sit there and you can start saying, well, what are the types of experiences that would lend themselves to that type of destiny that I am trying to chart my course for? How do I market myself? How do I strategically communicate my skills and my values and my cover letters and my resumes? We went over this. Was it last week? It seems with everything we found, it seems so long ago. But we went over this last week with the cover letter and the resume workshops. It also means that you can sit there going, well, are there people? Are there alums? Are there people who I might want to talk to that are doing that kind of work? So you can start your planning on who you want to develop contacts with. And as you start talking to them, this is where you start getting information the unadvertised information, and there is a lot of it. When I look at how people get jobs, we, as part of the survey process for people who graduate, and you collect information about, you know, where they're working, if they're working, all of that, we ask this question, how did you find employment? So of the approximately 300 people that graduated in the class of 2011, we got information from 83 graduates about how they found their job. So, you know, this is not everyone who was employed answering this question. Um, it certainly wasn't everyone out of the class answering the question. It was 83 graduates who indicated this. And here you get a breakdown of how they found their jobs, which means that when you think about it, I think one of the levels that is, by those who didn't respond to the question, is highly underrepresented is this area where you think about kind of a referral from colleague, which goes into, well, isn't that networking? You know, I add those two columns together. So, you know, there's three big buckets there. Follow CI for people that went into larger law firms, gen generally speaking, they were larger law firms. A job posting or some type of networking app opportunity. So with, what does that indicate for you as to where you want to spend your time? On the short game for your summer, we're going to talk a little bit about the OCI, but it's not a big extensive program like you see in the fall. Um, and, you know, and again, when you think about fall OCI, you start talking to the second and the third years about the number of people who get jobs through fall OCI. When you think about your long game and managing your career, is, is this the exclusive activity you want to have? Don't you want to be operating in all of these levels where you can be networking with people, thinking about OCI, and looking at job postings so that you can maximize opportunity? 
And there are actually OCIs throughout the year. So the bulk of the on-campus interviewing does happen in the fall because it is a structured program. Um, there are a few, of course, that happen in the spring, and as Vicki said, we'll talk more about that later. But there, OCIs, on-campus interviewing, is an ongoing fluid program. So it's not just at two distinct times during the year. Right. Okay, strategy. So strategy is huge. Huge for me, huge in advising. It should be a really important point for you. And I'd actually like to go back to the pyramid slide for a second because part of developing your strategy is looking at this pyramid and just you know having it, even if it's just a mental image, this is how we structure our advising appointments for um, the bulk of at least the initial appointments. And basically, we take it from the self-assessment up. So we take it from the foundation, the ground level, and we do the self-assessment. That's self-assessment is such an important part of strategy. It is the foundation that we build from, not only in your planning for your first, second, and third year and beyond, but it also sets the tone for what practice areas you may be thinking about, what environments you may be thinking about. Um, what you may want to do in the way of the fundamentals, which we'll also talk about. So it's a really important part in that process. And if you have a clear understanding of that path, that's fantastic and you work with it, but most people don't. So the initial appointment and, and even some uh, appointments beyond that really focus on that self-assessment because once you have that down, everything else sort of just tends to fall into place a little bit more. We can go back to the strategy yeah. slide. So strategy. As a first-year student, what you should be doing now First, I want to just make a broadcast announcement that every single one of you should have access to SU Law Jobs at this point. Um, you've actually had it since October 1st. I know some of you um, have been going on that, exploring it, exploring the employer database, um, and also the networking features, and that's fantastic. For those of you who don't know that, you do now. Um, you should have been emailed a username and password on October 1st. I mean, if you do not have that, don't worry about it. You can contact our office or come in, or we can do that at your initial uh, appointment. What will happen after you attend this program or watch the video, for those for those of you who are going to be watching the video, um, what you will need to do is get access to the job posting interface. And that's what we will do uh, after we record your attendance from this meeting. We will also talk about that in our initial session. So that is sort of step number one. And in line with that, making your initial advising session early is really important for a variety of reasons. One, because you get familiar with the system, you get familiar with our office, we begin talking about that strategy and that pyramid, um, we begin assessing your needs, your values, your interests, your background, um, your practice areas that you're thinking about, and we provide you with a lot of information and resources to get you started in the job search process. Um, in addition to that, we begin reviewing your materials, your resume, um, probably not so much the cover letter in the initial advising appointment, but most certainly the resume. And that's important because a lot of your job search that you're going to be doing or that job search process is going to be happening, happening over holiday break. So you're going to be going into finals, what, at the end of this month, or at least the last day of classes, I think is what, the 21st. Then you're going to be studying for and heading into finals. That doesn't give you a lot of room and flexibility between now and then to get familiar with our office, get your resume looked at, and make sure you understand the job search process and um, SCU law jobs. So making your initial appointment beginning today and going forward is really important. And then just that, strategy, researching jobs, researching <laughs> sites. It's not just about clicking through some websites and looking at the job board. It's so much more than that. And for me, I think the most important research you can be doing is finding out who the people are in the legal community that you want to connect with. Who are the people that you think are doing really interesting things, whether it's private practice, public sector, public interest, maybe something that would be considered alternative JD. Um, whatever that is, get to know who some of these people are and start building that connection. Really important strategy because the earlier you plant those seeds, when you go to find that job, say January, February, March, maybe even into April, you will have those connections established and they can begin working with you and for you to help accomplish your goals really important part of the strategy. And then getting down to the informational interview. You, you are going to hear this phrase so much during law school, you're going to get completely and totally sick of it. Um, but we can't stress the importance of it any, enough. Uh, informational interviewing, whatever you want to call it, connecting with employers, um, reaching out, um, networking, 
it's all part of this informational interview process. And what's so important about it is just going back from the statistics that we showed you, many, and I would even go as far as to say most jobs are obtained by people that you know, people making that referral for you, people reaching out to other people in the legal community and beyond to speak on your behalf, to say, hey, I worked with this person, um, he or she came in and had an informational interview with me, or we went to coffee, I think that he would be a great fit for your firm, or she would be a great fit for your agency, well, you know, here's the contact information, oh, and I happen to have a copy of their resume, you know, connect with them and see what you think. So many jobs are obtained that way. Uh, so it's really important to establish those connections. Okay, so beginning your job search, resources to get you started. I plug the website constantly. And the reason why I do that is because for me, this is one-stop shopping. And this is sort of the kayak of job search, if you will. And the reason why I say that is because at a glance on our homepage, you get access to all of our resource materials. Um, things like our handouts to our resumes, cover letters, informational interviewing, mock interviews to get you prepared for real interviews. Um, we have our career pathway wiki guides, which if you came to Gateway to Success Week, you heard that over and over and over again. And we also have uh, what we call our daily feeds of our Facebook, our Twitter, and we have access to our LinkedIn accounts, which we're going to talk more about LinkedIn in a few minutes. Um, we have our blog information, which for us, our blog is like, and our web, our homepage for that matter, is like our newsletter. So some law schools have a weekly newsletter. This is our weekly newsletter. This is our daily newsletter, if you will. And we also have our calendar, the LCS Community Events calendar, up front there. So any LCS event, any um, mixer, or anything from the community that our research team or our online communications team puts on there, you have at a glance. And it's not just on campus. Um, Greg and his team promote mixers and um, get-togethers and gatherings at firms and other locations all the time. Sometimes some ABA section meetings, so things of that nature. Look at the calendar for those ways to get out there and meet people in the legal community. It's actually really easy to get connected if you just follow these steps. And so this is a little bit more about our resources. And for those of you, just a show of hands, how many of you have this Passport to Success pamphlet? Okay. Well, that's great for you, those of you who have it. We have a few left for those of you who don't in our office. But basically, this is just this. This is your passport or your navigational guide, if you will, to what you should be doing as far back as August through next May. And what we've done is we've taken a snapshot of all the important timelines and essentials that will help you build that foundation that we talked about, that will help you along your journey through that pyramid. And it will also help us in our advising sessions because we can better understand where you're at, help you navigate, help build that strategy. And when we talk about advising, we're not just talking about the now. We're not talking about just summer. When we're sitting down with you and we're thinking about your career path, we're thinking about this summer, we're thinking about academic year next year, second summer, third year, and, grad and graduate, beyond graduate. So it's really important to think about it from a holistic perspective, not just what you're going to be doing in the next four months. And so if you go further into our website, you will see that we have additional resources, including the pathways that we talked about. We also provide self-assessment tools for those of you who want to get a better understanding or clarify where you're at as far as your interests. Um, again, like we talked about the environments you'd like to be working in, practice areas that you think you might like. And also, and most importantly, when, I, when I'm working with a student, to identify those strengths and weaknesses so that we can really build up and market those strengths, but then we can figure out where your weaknesses are and turn those into strengths. Really important strategy, especially in the interview process. And one other link uh, that I want to show uh, or just highlight on this for current students page is the handouts. I know it's not a sexy uh, title. Um, it's handouts, it's kind of generic. But I know I've had a lot of students who come into the office and they're like, I couldn't find how to build a resume. I couldn't find how to draft a cover letter. I couldn't find this, that, and the other. And I'm like, really? And I looked all over your website and I'm like, did you look in the handouts? And they're like, no. Um, but that's where they are. They're in the handouts, okay? So there's a handout, there's a resume handout, there's a cover letter handout, there's several handouts. So like I said, it's not a sexy title, but there, if there's a handout, it's in the handouts uh, tab. So use that link. 
Also, if you go onto our YouTube channel and you're like, man, you know, it's 3 in the morning. You're like, I know nobody would be in career services at 3 in the morning. And you're like, but I've got to figure out how to do this resume thing. What did they say? You can go, you can just search on our YouTube channel for resumes and you can probably get a couple videos that come popping up. So that's available to you also. So let's talk about the legal job market and some of this assessing. The legal job market, especially if you look at a law firm, <coughs> has almost a binary split between litigation and transactional. And so this is going to be one of the foundational questions that you are going to be asked by us, practicing attorneys, other people, which is, what are you interested in, litigation or transactional? And so you need to have, you need to be thinking about, well, which would I think, I, which one do I think I'm interested in? And you may be sitting here right now going, I have no idea. I have no idea. How should I know? I've taken all these classes, even my contracts class was taught out of cases. It comes out of a litigation background. So I don't know what it's really like to do transactional. This is again where you want to start talking to people who are doing that work because doing it is drastically different, exponentially different than what you got in contracts class, <coughs> which was reading cases about contracts that went bad. So. Um, so you really need to think about this binary split in the legal market. It's not the only question you ask yourself when you say, what do I want to do? Think very carefully about what clients you think you might want to work with. Do you want to work with a large corporation? I can tell you that's a very different advisory role than you're going to be in when you're dealing with Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Reyes, <coughs> who lives down the street in San Jose and has a family law issue has an estate planning issue. Um, I know that I've had this experience for myself where in my career after I finished my judicial clerkship, I went for a short period of time to a large law firm that had um, an office in the Southern California area and got involved with the commercial litigation team, thought, oh yeah, this is, this is great. And then I started doing the work and I was like, oh, holy cow, this is so not what I went to law school to do. This is, not the, this is not the advisory role I saw myself in, sitting in a room with a bunch of other young attorneys going through. It, then it was boxes of documents. Now it's going to be sitting on a computer screen and reading one page after another of computer text, looking at discovery, and trying to perform the discovery function on a large piece of litigation. It's like, I mean, it was nice to be in the room with them. It was interesting conversations. They were interesting people. But I went to law school to deal with everyday issues of human beings because I had this sense of social justice. And my sense of social justice had to do with, you know, the person who has been discriminated against in employment or who can't resolve an issue with an insurance company needs legal representation. If they could figure it out on their own, they wouldn't need you. They wouldn't come to your office. And it's like, I need to find a different kind of practice. And it really shifted. It shifted how I practiced. It shifted who I worked for. It shifted the types of clients. So think about what types of clients you want to work with, not just the areas of law that might be interesting to you, because that will have an effect upon the organizations and the types of firms, agencies, that you might be looking at, corporations that you might be looking at. We all have our own individual preferences and they differ from one person to another. So your path may look different from your friends and your study group. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. It's your path. This is again going back to being the master of your own destiny and thinking through what it is you want to work with and who you want to work for. Um, you know, I used to have people coming in saying, well, I want to do something international. I don't know if go, all of you will do something international. Even the person who does domestic relations work in San Jose, because, that, because the person getting divorced may be married to someone who was a foreign national from another country who's here on an HB1 visa, and now that person's thinking, gosh, you know, I kind of want to go back to my country of origin, and I've got to work out a custody arrangement to think about where my children live. Do they live here in San Jose, or do they go somewhere else far flung in the world? So um, for those of you who are thinking international, I think that the practice of that is going to be so multifaceted all over the place. Um, 
in terms of what you're doing, that you can certainly look at opportunities from our study abroad programs all throughout here domestically as well. And from a logistics perspective, uh, thinking about this, the split in the market, thinking about where your interests align, going back to that self-assessment, you know, all this is part of developing your media kit, if you will. That's how I like to look at it, your marketing package. What are you developing into that media kit? So as Vicki said, what might be right for you may not be right for somebody else. The way you express yourself on your resume may be very different from someone that you're, you know, your study partner um, or your classmate. It doesn't matter. You're focusing on you and your overall marketability and where the employer is going to find those strengths. So how that c develops and comes out in your resume may be very different from someone sitting next to you, and that's okay. It could even be something cosmetic, the style, the format. Are we bringing out those marketable points? What content do we have to work with? If there's a lot, we have to be strategic about it. If there's not that much, we really have to be strategic about it. So think about you as this media kit that you're presenting, not just to employers, but to yourself in order to uh, finally tune your pitch, if you will. So it all interconnects. It's really important to understand that message. And your messaging will change from one type of employer to another. May even change from one employer in one type of employer, where you're like, oh, these are all Firms that do similar type of work, it may change from one firm in that grouping of employers to another. Right, and you may have a couple of different resumes. We had a panelist here at our resume program who has five different resumes. You know, depending on if you're targeting a public interest community or a corporate community or a federal position, the way you market yourself and the practical skills or the academic skills or the personal personal things about you that you bring out can change depending on who your target audience is. So don't think that you will just have one flat resume because a lot of times that's not going to cut it for a wide variety of employers. So, you, so one important lesson that we can teach you is learn to be flexible and adaptable because you're going to have to do that over and over again as a first year, second year, third year in grad. Okay, so assessing the market, what does this mean in combination with everything else? Resources to get you started. How can you assess if you don't know where to begin, right? So these are some steps that will help you with that. In addition to the initial advising appointment that you're going to have with us, these are some areas where you can very easily get started in finding out about employers, positions, different practice areas represented. Um, you know, we, as Vicki said, with international law, we get people who say, you know, I want to do corporate law. Well, what does that mean? You know, do you want to do it internationally, domestically? Do you want to focus, you know, what do you want to focus on within that umbrella of corporate law? It's huge. Same with international law. Same with a lot of other practice areas. So begin to understand what these terms and different areas are and what they mean. SE Law Jobs. SE Law Jobs is not just job postings. That's what most of you go to it for, but it also houses over 5,000 employers. It also houses our, our uh, one in a series of networking um, information that we provide to you. We have our professional network through um, Simplicity, and then we also have the mentor directory through LinkedIn, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, <coughs> Government Honors Handbook. This is probably the most underutilized resource that we have. It's housed in Clarinet, and for those of you who don't know how to get to our main index in Clarinet, you basically go to um, Clarinet site, you type in Law Career, click on our course, Click on Law Career, it'll route you to the password, which is Miller for Clarinet. That will bring you up to our homepage in Clarinet, or our main index, if you will. And then you're going to scroll down through some folders that are in there. And one of them is Government Honors Handbook. Government Honors Handbook is sort of the mothership of all federal programs. It has everything at a first year, second year, third year, and post grad or honors glance. There's a, there's a very easy to read table, and then under that table, it lists out specific um, links with things like satellite offices and other information that might be pertinent to you. And for those of you who are thinking about a federal position but can't or don't necessarily want to go to D.C. or New York to do that, there are many satellite offices throughout the country and several in the Bay Area, not for all agencies but for many. So it, it really is an opportunity that you may want to explore that is cross-marketable to many different types of employers. Public interest, lots of different sites to choose from. Uh, we tend to promote public service job directory, uh, formerly PS Lawnet, because it houses um, sort of like government honors, it's sort of the mothership of public sector public interest positions. 
In addition to that, for those of you who might want to go into the private sector but want to have a public interest focus, they also house a very large directory of public interest law firms. So it's a great resource to take advantage of. Um, and then small firms. Small firms is, can be a little bit frustrating to research because there is not a lot of information housed in one area for the small firm market. Um, there is Martindale.com, which is very helpful in locating some of these firms or some of these attorneys at these firms, but it is subscription-based. So, for example, there may be 300 family law attorneys, um, half of whom are SU law graduates, but perhaps only 20 or 30 uh, come up in Martindale, and that's because it's subscription-based, but it's a great starting point to use in combination with things like CalBar and other search sites to get that information about employers. And this is a market where the unadvertised job market is really important. The hiring on small firm market is done so much through a shadow network basis. Um, when I left that large commercial firm and decided that, you know, that's not what I went to law school for, I ended up working for a firm where I was the second attorney. And so, really, teeny tiny firm. It was like the two polar opposites, right, of law firms. And, you know, it's like if you said, well, do you guys list somewhere? It's like, no. Uh, do you, um, and we weren't unique. I mean, I've talked to so many small firm practitioners. Do you post jobs? It was like, mm, no, if we were gonna hire someone, mm, no, no, we wouldn't. And, but it didn't mean that we wouldn't necessarily hire someone. It just means that our recruiting would have been done differently. Which was, and then there's reasons why. I mean, when you think about, you're going to be the second lawyer in a teeny tiny <coughs> law firm, what does that tell you about those people? You have to be pretty entrepreneurial. The person you're looking for in terms of who they are is not the person who just responded to a job ad. You want someone who's also a go-getter, and how do you demonstrate that? They showed up in your office. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, they showed up through some way, shape, or form. We just met with an employer a couple of weeks ago, and he flat out said, I do not hire people based upon a job posting. I hire people that I meet. I want to have that interpersonal, that one-on-one. -on -one. I want to be able to connect with them. And he actually has a couple Santa Clara students in there right now. And he did not hire them based upon a job posting. He hired them based upon a conversation. So that is really important to understand and know and really get your marketing pitch down because a lot of these employers are going to hire you based upon their personal connection with you or if you're going to fit into that office environment or if you have a general understanding or a passion or a drive or a focus for what they're doing. That speaks volumes. That's hard to read out of a flat resume. Okay, and then so large firms, probably one of the easiest <coughs> things to explore and research because there is a lot of information out there. Um, because we are a member of NALP and uh, we promote the NALP directory, um, it is easily accessible. You can also find out a lot of statistical information about large firms on here, including who the hiring manager and hiring partners are, the recruiter. Um, with contact information, it's free and open to the public. Um, you can also find out information like summer class size, lateral hires, things of that nature, how many offices. In addition to this, I absolutely love and work with, um, quite often, the Chambers Associate Guide. Mm -hmm. And we hand out a print directory of the Chambers Associate Guide, and you can also access that online. And they not only have a domestic version, they have several international versions as well. So using that in combination with NALP is an excellent combination and maximizing your resources. It's really great. Corporations. Um, actually, it's pretty easy to identify and pinpoint corporations and do a little bit of research. Um, Glassdoor is fantastic. I use it pretty much every day. You can do corporate searches. You can do legal searches. You have to be very specific in the search criteria, but a lot of information comes up. And what I love about it is you get a snapshot of the information, but then it will also route you to either other job feeders or the corporation's website in and of itself. It's fantastic. Um, for those of you who are interested in the more financial aspects of corporate or perhaps venture capital, VentureLoop.com is also great because it brings up the job, but it also brings up the capital or the funding behind the job, and it will give you a profile of that company um, as well. So it's phenomenal. And for those of you who are thinking, well, yeah, do they post internships or externships? Um, most likely, no. But what you're doing is your background research. How can you actively find a position as an intern if you don't know what they're looking for? So look at these positions. You know, look, see what they're looking for at entry level, three to five years out, because that's how you're going to establish your pattern of interest as a student. And you begin to 
um, develop that communication with employers because you understand the terminology, you understand the focus, you understand what it is that they're going to expect of you coming out of law school. Really important. And then judicial externships, you can look for that on, um, there, are, there are about at least 10 or 11 links to various um, court websites through Academic and Professional Development's Externship Resource Guide. I highly recommend it. You can get the guide off of the APD website. In addition to judicial information, they have um, well over 100 links to other job search um, sites, companies, public interest, public sector, government, program, all across the board. It's a fantastic resource, so print out a copy if you don't have it. Okay, so we've talked a lot about connecting with people and exchanging information in a very personal format. So let's go over some of the resources that you can take advantage of uh, with regard to that. For those of you who, um, at orientation, submitted the expression of interest in the Student Alumni Dinner Program, which is what it was. It was not a registration for the Student Alumni Dinner Program. It was an expression of interest in the Student Alumni Dinner Program. And then got an email saying, you're not registered for the uh, Student Alumni Dinner Program. That's because you submitted an expression of interest, but you didn't register for it. So um, if you did not yet register for the program, but are interested in registering for the program, there are still spaces available. They are more limited, but there are spaces available. Um, in order to register, you need to have come to two of the programs for Gateway to Success Week or watch them on the internet, on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can absolutely do that. For those of you who did do that, and actually registered, you got the little sticker and you stuck it on somebody's name. You may be wondering, well, when in the heck is this dinner going to occur? So I talked to Andrea Shaheen, who is managing that project for us. She has already given the attorneys whose spaces have filled uh, the information about who they are matched with. And you should probably, in about a week or so, get an email from that attorney indicating that um, they're looking forward to hosting you and they're looking to schedule that, that interaction, that group meeting. Um, for those of you, uh, for the attorneys who are still open, if they, if they have spots that are open, but they have students who signed up, Andrea is planning on sending them information tomorrow about those who have signed up. Uh, so there would still be spots available, but it, you may find that you're, you know, making your plans based upon everyone else's uh, schedule and their availability. And for those attorneys who do not have sign-ups, like I said, there's still space available. So um, watch some videos um, if you want to participate in the program and come in and sign up for those attorneys. Um, with regard to the program, you need to understand that these attorneys are doing this out of the goodness of their heart. The program's unfunded by the school, so they are paying for the dinner out of their own pockets. Um, they're looking forward to interacting with you. This is a time for you to really, again, set your professional reputation with someone who is an alum. So things that would be really, really bad would be not being responsive to the attorney, uh, not communicating with them, not being a no-show. We've had students who have done these things that have been no-shows, flaky, said they were coming to the dinner. We had someone who um, is the managing partner of a law firm who did a catered dinner at his house, invited his, the other partners to come, and had out of the five students he was gonna have come to his home, meet his family, his wife, his partners in business, had one, one show up with the other four not even sending a note to say I'm not coming. Okay, that was, that was a really bad thing to manage uh, on the back end. So don't be, don't be that person. At Barrister's Fall time, you'll have Susan Irwin posting all these flyers around the law school that say, don't be underwear girl. You can ask around who underwear girl is. Don't be flaky person, okay? Like that would be a bad thing to do. Um, so <laughs> with regard to other ways to connect with alumni, there is an alumni mentor directory on the Law Career Services LinkedIn group. I like what Greg said. These are the people who are waiting on the other end of the phone for you to call them. Okay, they're, they're just waiting. They are. They want to connect with you. There are many other LinkedIn groups you can join. There's one for Santa Clara Law Alumni. There's one for Santa Clara. There's 
wants for the Computer High Tech Law Journal, uh, lawyers, Santa Clara lawyers, and high tech jobs. There are many LinkedIn groups there. For those of you interested in tax, estate planning, financial services, there's a mixer next week at Hopkins and Carley with our alums. It's not just the alums at Hopkins and Carley. Um, you can still register for that by going upstairs to LCS. And then, of course, there is that community calendar on the LCS website um, with activities outside of the school. In addition to the LinkedIn groups that Vicki mentioned, there are also some other groups from a larger career network through the main university. There is a long government LinkedIn group, which is fantastic and posts internships and jobs. There is also, and we tend to cross post those on SU Law Jobs, there's also an environmental one, which is great, and also a public interest one. So um, in addition to the ones that you see through the law school, there are other uh, LinkedIn groups through the main university that you can absolutely take advantage of. And uh, for high-tech law LinkedIn group for the, the law alumni LinkedIn group, they post jobs. So it's not just a blog, it's not just connecting with people in the legal community, you can actually find great positions on there as well. So absolutely take advantage of it. And that brings up a good point that in our webpage, on our daily feeders, sometimes on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and Facebook, we post positions that may not get posted to SCU Law Jobs for time reasons and other. So we have our research team go out and basically mine for positions. And they go and they post some of these positions that might have a quick turnaround. So don't just use SCU Law Jobs as your primary resource. Use the ones that we've talked about. Use the LinkedIn groups. Look at our daily feeders on our webpage because these, these are, this is all information available to you at very or little effort. Very little or none. Um, actually, it's basically just scanning a website. And you can find maybe up to, up to about 10 positions on any given day, just utilizing the resources we've mentioned. So use this in combination with your networking. Okay. So external communications, fundamentals. Um, we are really big on the fundamentals, going back to our conversation about that foundation. What are fundamentals and what does it mean for you? So the fundamentals means your resume, your cover letter. It means your writing sample and how to choose or select that writing sample based upon your employer or maybe tweaking your LARA midterm or your LARA final, your advocacy brief. So you will get to know what represents a good writing sample and what doesn't. Um, networking. Networking is the most important fundamental skill you can learn as a law student. Can't say it enough. You will need it over and over again, not just for the job search process, but also communicating with people in the legal community in a way that presents your knowledge base about the practice area, um, your knowledge base about that particular sector of the law, and connecting with them on an interpersonal level. Very important, absolutely a fundamental. I and mean, that's something that we can help you with. So if you have discomfort about approaching people or you have discomfort about making that initial contact, let us know because we can help you with that, that introductory conversation. Um, I help students write introductory emails to get the process going every day. Every day I'm helping a student write an introductory email so that they can meet that person. I have no problem doing that. Vicki <clears throat> has no problem doing that. So don't be afraid to ask us for help. That's why we're here. Okay, Spring OCI, is there one? Yes. Is it like fall recruitment? No. So I get people asking me all the time, what's Spring OCI? Should I be planning for Spring OCI? Spring OCI is sort of the baby sister, if you will, of fall OCI. So fall OCI, or fall recruitment, what we actually call it, is a large program. That's when most of the large firms and some public sector um, do the bulk of their second summer recruiting. Outside of large firm and some public sector and some corporate other agencies, small firms, mid-sized firms, some other corporations, some other um, government agencies, um, certainly DA and PD's offices, tend to hire closer to the spring. So what that means for you is around, and when we, when we say spring, we mean January, February, and going into March. And what some of these firms will do is they will come in and do what's called the Spring OCI, where they interview anywhere from 5 to up to 25 students for a summer position. So if it's a small firm or a mid-sized firm or a corporation like Cisco last year who came during spring OCIs, their target hiring range is about six to eight weeks out of their needs. So fall recruitment doesn't work for them. It serves no purpose. So they're going to take advantage of this January, February, and March time frame. And that's something that you're going to learn throughout your exposure with us is the timelines of employers and when they're hiring. So large firm is going to hire early. 
small firm is going to hire closer to their needs, most likely a mid-sized firm as well. Corporations tend to hire closer to their needs unless um, there's a particular program. Um, and then we can talk about government and public interest because they tend to be across the board depending on the program or the agency. So look for Spring OCI. It's not going to be in the OCI interface in Simplicity. It's going to be on in the Job Postings and Resume Collect tab. And what you will see is something along the lines of um, Resume Collect for Spring OCI or Resume Collect. Uh, so look for that language, and you can absolutely apply. OK, so navigating SDU Law Jobs. Uh, this is, for those of you who have already logged in to SDU Law Jobs, this is what your home page will look like. Uh, you will have the job postings and resume collect tab in there um, after you after this program. Um, so up at the top is your navigation bar, pretty self-explanatory. Most of you have used something similar to this or have used a simplicity system before, maybe an undergrad. Um, for those of you who need some assistance, we can certainly go over that in our initial advising session. Um, also, in, at your homepage, you have some quick links that will route you to some other information, and then you have some announcements. Um, we tend to post program announcements here. We certainly post OCI-related information here, um, and any other information that you would find uh, relevant or important. So look at that homepage um, because we do post more than just um, the general information there in the navigation bar. Um, okay. Okay. Let's. I know time is fleeting, so let's talk about timelines and when you need to begin job searching. You really need to begin now. Yeah. Okay. And you're playing both, as I mentioned, a short game and a long game. Okay, and I know this is like, oh man, I'm getting my law row final tomorrow, and this is not feeling fun. And um, I'm sorry about that, but you know what? You're entering into the legal profession, and there's going to be a lot of moments where you're going to be handling and managing all, a lot of projects with competing um, deadlines. And so this is part of that whole introduction to the profession and dealing with that time management and that project management. In terms of large firms, they really do. For the mail directory, you can look for firms. You can do an advanced search to find the firms that are taking resumes from one else. They will look at them generally in December. Do not apply to them before December 1st. They are members of now. They can't receive your application materials before December 1st. If you send it to them before December 1st, A, they won't look at it, and B, they're going to feel really kind of uh, nervous. And they call us to tell us that they feel really kind of nervous. So apply on or after December 1st. For judicial externships, those of you that are interested in Southern California and the federal courts down there, those judges like to do their hiring in December also. So you're going to have to be applying, for those of you that want to go back to the LA Basin area, you want to be thinking about December. Other judicial externships, January is a really big time to be doing your applications. Small firms all over the map. Like I said, there's no uniformity with regard to their recruiting patterns and practices. Corporations, same thing. Government internship programs. There are government internship programs on the federal level that are taking your applications now. So you need to go into that government honors handbook to look at that if that's of interest to you. Um, study abroad, they've got their own timeline. You'll be dealing with the Center for Global Law and Policy about that. Public interest, the public interest career fair at Hastings is one of the biggest events for first years to find their jobs. Uh, those of you that are interested in patents, you'll be applying and you'll be registering in February for the Loyola Patent Fair, which occurs in July. <coughs> And um, also, there are, uh, if you're an electrical engineer, computer science uh, major, yeah, this was your major before you came to law school, there are firms that are going to be uh, looking now in December and the spring for uh, people who are applying in that. So you should be thinking about December, January applications. In fact, I know Morrison and Forster, which has had this two year program for their patent people calls us in December and they're like, how come we have no applications? I'm like, they're taking finals. And it's like, well, we still want the applications. And then, of course, those of you that are going public interest, remember all of your grant deadlines. They sneak up on you. They're in January, February, March, which means that you don't find a job in public interest before that. In terms of career advising, there's three of us that do uh, advising. We work with all students that are job searching and all graduates who are job searching. It's a lot of people for three people. In terms of, so that means that, you know, you may not get into someone exactly when you want to see them, and you need to manage that also, because if you're like, oh my gosh, my application's due tomorrow, you may not have someone who, and you're like, it's 5 o'clock tonight, who's available. 
before tomorrow. Uh, we do have the 2012 graduates who are awaiting bar results who are working with us until mid-December um, who said that they would help us some triaging um, on, you know, some resumes. Uh, so Greg and Carolyn said they would be willing to do that also. In terms of PIPS day, let me, yeah, let's go over that really quickly. Um, I'll do it. Just know that your application window is January 2nd through January 18th. Notice your first day of school, January 14th. Again, is four days going to be a sufficient amount of time to come back and pull all your application materials together? This is where you need to be thinking about the fact that you need to be prepared December 13th on to be doing your job searching for this. And this is a very big event in terms of people finding jobs. And one thing about PIPS Day, it's not just public interest, it's also public, public sector. sector. And for those of you who are in the program, you know, it's an entire building of public sector. So that means federal programs, federal agencies, um, DAs, PDs, U.S. Attorney's Office. You know, those are the types of agencies that are going to be there. So even if you're interested in corporate law, well, you know what? Doing an internship at a federal agency is extremely marketable to a corporate practice group. So broaden your horizons a little bit and think about how you can incorporate some of these internships or internship opportunities into your overall strategy. In terms of your job, so many people, you're learning law right now in a structure where you are analyzing precedent out of this very logical structure. And the, usually they come in and they're trying to apply the same structure to their job search and how they're managing their careers. And so they come in and they're like, maybe if this is like a totem pole, which job goes on top of the other? Careers don't develop that way. They unfold in a very circuitous, messy fashion. This means that the job you take right now is the right one, okay? And it can lead all over the place. So don't be looking for which job is better, best, it's got to be even better than that. It just doesn't work that way. So uh, the important thing is, is that when you're playing both the short and the long game, is that you think about building up your experience. In the long run, you need to be a practice-ready lawyer. You need to be able to talk the language of the lawyers and explain that you have experiences. So think about the fall semester, next year, and the long game. Think about not only this summer, Realize that you have deadlines that are going to start in the spring for the fall um, and how you're going to, again, manage getting a lot of experience during the course of three years of law school to leave here and put yourself in the most marketable place you can be. Um, I know we're coming up against, you know, the hours, so um, are there any quick questions? Yes. How do we make the, uh, the initial advising board? You can go online. You can go online. You can call our office. You can go to the front desk. It's pretty Go to our website. There's, there's a link to make it a good one. Okay.